Hello, this is Mark Tooley, editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy with yet one more episode of Marxism with fellow editors and fellow Marx, Mark Lebecki Hello. and Mark Melton. Hello, fellow Marx. Good morning. Hello. Good to be a Mark. Well, we're going to start uh, by my asking Mark Lovecki about a piece we published this week from Walter Russell Mead on the roots of American foreign policy. So, uh, Mark Lovecki, tell us a little bit about that. I uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, I, I should be all ready to say what the providence of that was, but uh, he was at a Asp Aspen summit so meeting. It was a rich so it was an article originally published in um, Aspenina. Aspenina, it's a an Italian Italian, right? So it was originally published in Italian. We published the English version. I think it was originally published late last year or early. Right. This year. Okay, well, in it, it's a it's a lovely article as ever from Walter Russell Mead. He uh, one of the things that I find most intriguing is he goes through his four schools of international thought, the Jacksonians, the Jeffersonians, the Hamiltonians, and the Wilsonians. And he gives an overview of that again, and then he sort of projects forward and, and wonders what will happen with these four schools of thought, um, especially in light of the rise of China, and what I think he hopes to be a, a coalescing recognition that there is indeed a threat from China, and that the various schools of US foreign policy have to come together as we did under the Cold War, uh, to unite against this new uh, and growing common threat. Uh, that's the gist of the article and what he's after. Um, what I always find intriguing about his, his paradigms is, you know, on the, on the one hand, they're really effective because everybody likes these sorts of personality profiles, right? Am I, a, am I a leader? Am I a sheep? Am I a wolf? Am I, what am I, where do I fit into this? And so when I read his, uh, his four schools description, you know, the question that's now on my mind, and maybe it's a question we should put to Walter uh, for Providence at some point, is where does the Christian realist fit into this? And I, it's an intriguing question to me because I don't think the Christian realist fits neatly into any of those four schools, which is to suggest then that there must be something else out there uh, that a, uh, some other sort of school that a, a, a political thinker can fit into. And I strongly suspect that the, the Christian realist provides a sort of, ideally anyway, provides a kind of coalescing factor, bringing together what is hopefully the best of the four schools while avoiding their, their excesses or their deficiencies. Uh, you know, the, I think the Christian realist is a blend of a Jacksonian uh, realism on the one hand and an, and an inward focused responsibility toward one's own constituency, but also sort of a, an aspiring Wilsonian view that we can be responsible to people outside our own borders. Uh, we can, uh, you know, sort of spread the love and spread the wealth and the, the goodness of, of core American or Western values. Uh, so it would be interesting to, uh, to ask, where does the Christian realist fit into this? Because he seems to be a blend of several of the schools. And I think the Christian realist plays to the margins. We should be realistic almost to the point of being cynical, almost, not quite cynical. Don't, you know, don't cross the line. But we should also be idealistic, almost to the point of appearing naive or, or sentimental or even romantic. So I think the, the Christian realist plays to the margins in a number of these different schools. Mark Levecki, uh, remind us what these four schools are. You mentioned Wilsonian, Jacksonian, Jeffersonian, Hamiltonian. Uh, Wilsonian right. would be familiar to most of us in terms of promoting world uh, democracy, world order. Jacksonian, American interest, vigorously right. pursued, unilaterally if need be. Uh, what are the Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian? So we'll get Melton to jump in if I uh, if I botch this. The the Jeffersonian is so you can make one large cleave. It seems you've got the Jacksonians and the Jeffersonians, easily remembered because they're the Jays. And then on the other side, you've got the Hamiltonians and the Wilsonians, and and they they cleave to two largely diverse perspectives. As you said, the Jacksonians are are the American exceptionalists. That could be very different depending on the Jacksonian and their expression of American exceptionalism might be different than what I would say is exceptional about America. Uh, but it is an inward focus. It is America first kind of thing, probably not the Charles Lindbergh kind of thing, but maybe. 
Uh, but the Jacksonian prefers to just keep their hands off as little government as necessary, um, not necessarily as, as little government as possible. They recognize that government occasionally does need to step in, both domestically but also abroad. Uh, the Jacksonian foreign policy, I think Walter describes, is almost being the sleeping giant. If you leave us alone, everybody's going to get along just fine. Uh, but if you, if, you, you know, if you hit us in Hawaii, you're going to wake the giant. Uh, don't do it. Uh, so the Jacksonian uh, will pursue American interests, and they will pursue American interests to the nth degree. So Sherman's March on the Sea, um, Walter gesture to the air, air campaign over Japan. So I, I probably have a little bit of a Jacksonian bent when I press for the bombing of Hiroshima as being the right thing to do. There's probably a little bit of Jacksonian mixed into that. Uh, the Jeffersonian is the extreme of that. They really prefer to stay out of things almost altogether. And you see this a little bit. There was a good, was it a Brian Kilmeade book uh, where it looked at, uh, I'm going to botch this, the Jeffersonian and the, uh, I can't remember who the other guy was. It might have been Adams. Uh, two different views of how to deal with the, the Barbary pirates. And the Jeffers, you know, Jefferson really wanted to, at first, to stand off, uh, not build a big navy and not confront and do, just to do different things. He eventually came around. Uh, the Hamiltonians are like the Wilsonians, but I think they want to pursue American values in order to bring uh, money home and to promote capitalism something sort of like that. I, I tend to probably find myself more Jacksonian, Wilsonian, depending on how much coffee I've had or mm. you know, something like that. Melton, is that a fair, fair job? You're better at these sorts of categories than I am. Yeah, yeah, uh, well, yeah I think that's pretty fair. The, uh, so yeah, the Jacksonian is going to be very hands-off until they get punched in the nose. And then they become, it's almost like a whiplash of being very almost isolationist and mm. then being incredibly aggressive. Um, in its foreign policy. The Jeffersonians would be, I think, more like a libertarian style, yeah, or, right. either libertarian, or you could also be a Bernie Sanders socialist. And so you can kind of see on the political spectrum, almost like a, maybe like the U uh, person or the U idea of politics where the edges of either party are almost more in similar together than like the center or the moderates. But anyway, so, um, so you'd be Jeffersonian and the Democratic Party in a socialist sense, and the idea is like you build liberty at home, or you could be libertarian, um, and the kind of want the same foreign policy, but want very different policies and domestic issues. And so, and then like you said, Wilsonian would be the spreading democracy, or um, one of the things that, you know, Woodrow Wilson was believing in was the idea of uh, nations being independent and so, but that's obviously where that idea comes from. Um, and then the Hamiltonians, I would probably, I would phrase it maybe a little different than like they want to bring home the money to uh, the idea of they, you know, when the, when the global order is stable, then that's better for America's interest overall. And so the reason why we're interested in the South China Sea from a Hamiltonian perspective isn't because we're trying to make democracies out of China or some of these other countries in the area, but because a third of global trade goes through that area. And uh, the Hamiltonians would say, like, if that area was to uh, you know, be either China, dominated by China, or there was to be a war there, then one, that would hurt our pocketbooks, but two, um, we would, you know, uh, get dragged into the war. Um, what else was I thinking about on that front? But um, Well, I suppose that uh, when people think of a Christian foreign policy, it's Wilsonianism that uh, would immediately come to mind. But uh, as right. Mark Rebecca points out, uh, there are spiritual aspects to each of these uh, four schools, although it seems like the Jacksonian and the Wilsonian would be the most uh, recognizably spiritual and even Presbyterian uh, with the Jacksonian, it's, uh, I'm going to take care of my family, but uh, you mess with us and uh, I will enact the vengeance of the Lord upon you. And uh, Wilsonian, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, building God's kingdom uh, universally. Well, as always, uh, Walter Russell Mead is um, fascinating and showcases an amazing understanding of uh, America's uh, character as a nation. Mm. Mark Melton, uh, tell us a little bit about this article from a new writer whose name uh, pronunciation we're unclear about, but uh, Jeffrey Simino, Simino? My guess is Jeffrey Simino. We'll have mm -hmm. him correct us. So uh, 
he is at the Atlantic Council, but he wrote an article about why should we be supporting religious freedom to counter China. And uh, he gives us uh, different reasons. One is that, um, you know, it's actually like polls show that people's Americans support the idea of religious liberty abroad. Um, he brings up that China has a you know, weak point on religious liberty, um, not just you know, Uyghur Muslims, Tibet, and so forth, and that the United States needs to keep hitting China on this particular issue. Um, and he gives kind of, kind of going back to the different schools of thought, um, different reasons which I think the, you know, Hamiltonians or the, um, you know, Jacksonians and Wilsonians could probably get on board with uh, different reasons for supporting that. So that's basically a short synopsis of his mm. article. Any thoughts, Mark Levecki? I no, I, th I think that's a good encapsulation. I I I, I track with with Melton's, you know, sort of trying to plot the four schools there uh, because he does point out there's a, a pragmatic. I think he says a moral, and then um, I can't remember what is. Uh, he's got he's got three benefits of doing this. One of them is pragmatic, and one of them is moral. And I think I think that encapsulates Christian realism uh, to a good degree. You should be both pragmatic. Uh, but you should be moral. Uh, the pragmatic bit I found interesting where he suggests that if America continues to or should continue to call China uh, to the floor when they violate human rights and that this pragmatically will uh, you know, help to, to uh, bring together the world's opinion against China and compel Chinese behavior. That's an oversimplification of what he says and he could say it much better. Um, my big question mark there is whether or not enough of the world, particularly enough of the West cares about religious liberty to make that actually a pragmatic strategy. I think it's a good strategy. I think we should do it. Um, but an awful lot of people benefit uh, from being quiet about China, an awful lot of individuals, an awful lot of corporations, probably an awful lot of nations. Uh, so this wouldn't be the first time that divine things take a back seat to a bit of silver. So I'm, I'm probably less um, satanically optimistic about the pragmatic approach than maybe some are. Well, if I recall correctly, our contributing editor, uh, Tom Farr of the Rel Religious Freedom Institute makes uh, very similar arguments in terms of uh, idealism and pragmatism uh, intertwined on the issue of religious liberty for American uh, foreign policy. Uh, in terms of Christian realism, uh, I can't recall that Reinhold Niebuhr expressed a lot of specific interest about international religious liberty. It didn't seem to have been a major item on his radar screen. Maybe you can mull that over, Mark Levecki. And finally, uh, looking, I'm sorry, Mark Belton, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I've been going through some Christianity and crisis articles, and I think there's one in 1945 about international religious liberty that mm. um, trying to get ready. So I don't mm. think it was written by Niebuhr, but someone else yeah. at Christianity in Crisis. We'll have to post that on the Providence uh, website. And then finally, a piece that uh, did not appear in Providence, but in our uh, sister publication, Juicy Ecumenism on Christian realism, 10 principles of it, uh, plus one. I had uh, emailed Mark Levecki uh, late in the evening asking for 10 principles, and I think uh, within about 20 minutes I had 750 words articulating 11 principles of Christian realism. So Mark Levecki, tell us a little bit about your 10 principles plus one for Christian realism. Yeah, right. Uh, that must have been a good coffee day for me. <laughs> uh, to, uh, off the top of my head, I'm not going to be able to recall all 10 plus one, but roughly five major categories that I tend to um, plot within or plot Christian realism within. Uh, the five being uh, drawn from Hebraic tradition. Uh, the large categories are a recognition of creation, uh, the fall, human fall, uh, the idea of restoration, the idea of responsibility, and then sort of uh, kind of a sober-minded uh, uh, future orientation, uh, a hope rooted in future orientation. So creation, basically, uh, human beings created in the image of God, uh, find what it means to be created in the image of God, 
best expressed in the idea of exercising dominion. Uh, we, were, we were created to exercise stewardship over the earth. I think there are political ramifications of what that means, responsible governance and things like this. Um, that mandate was, of course, compromised. The Christian realist rec recognizes uh, because of the human fall. Uh, because of the fall, we have distanced ourselves from our creation mandate. We've distanced ourselves from responsibility, from the love of creation, from the love of neighbor, from the love of ourselves, from the love of the divine. We turned our mind towards uh, selfish and worldly things, that sort of thing. So when one pursues uh, political policies, they need to keep that in mind. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a limit to the Wilsonian aspiration in that sense. Uh, and then there's restoration. The idea that while we recognize that uh, all of evil cannot be eradicated within history, certain evils can be eradicated. Um, and history has borne that out. And the Christian tradition has created a number of moral frameworks to help us figure out uh, how to uh, play a restorative role in the world. Uh, among the ones that we talk about a lot is the just war tradition, which is a, a tradition of Christian intelligence that helps us to understand when force needs to be brought to bear uh, in order to protect the innocent or to take back what's been wrongly taken uh, or to punish evil. Uh, then I move into responsibility and I break that down a little bit uh, into looking at, you know, what would be, uh, what are some of the spurs and limits to American power? How should American power be exercised? Um, you know, one of, one of my uh, rants is that I don't think American power is accidental. I don't think we simply found ourselves surrounded by oceans and two friendly neighbor, neighbors and therefore powerful. Uh, there was that. There was, you know, uh, maybe a providential or a geographical dimension to it. But we've also been serious about cultivating power. And I think that is a Christian principle, that when you have a capacity for something, uh, in most situations, one ought to uh, develop that capacity. Uh, power is not an evil. Power is a good that, like all goods, can be perverted because, again, of the human fall. Uh, but power ought to be cultivated, and then it ought to be exercised for the common good. So I talk about American power. Uh, and then... On top of all of that, there is this idea of the church and future hope that our aspirations need to be humble and limited, recognizing, as I've already said, that we're not going to eliminate evil in time. Our aspirations should be somewhat lower. Uh, we should be content at times with an approximation of justice, content at times with an approximation of peace. This is where the Jeffersonian or maybe the Jacksonian uh, sobriety comes in. Uh, you know, we can't be satanically optimistic like the Wilsonians. Um, so we have to be uh, realist about what we can accomplish. And that sometimes means not doing what we ought to do, because trying to do it is only going to result in greater amounts of evil for uh, you know, a greater number of people. Um, so Christian realism encapsulated, it's neither satanic optimism nor a sort of uh, Beelzebubian cynicism. It's, it's avoiding the, uh, the extremes of both. That was the attempt. Excellent. And I think that uh, some of the uh, harshest critics of Christian realis realism, uh, the Hauerwasians, the Yodarians, would claim that uh, Christian realism, perhaps it's rooted in the creation, certainly it focuses heavily on the fall, but they would deny there's any recognition of redemption, that there's any Christology there. But you're saying, no, that's not correct. And in fact, there is a uh, hope about a rejuvenated world understood within Christian realism. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, yeah, absolutely. This, uh, the Christian story makes no sense to me if the actions of God within history do not suggest that history matters, do not suggest that matter matters. And, you know, that th th there's something to be said for the fact that it's going to be a renewed Jerusalem, not an entirely new Jerusalem. There's something to that. Um, I, I look forward to a renewed earth and I want to know what that's going to look like. And I think the scars and the warts are still going to be there. I think when we're sharing a whiskey in paradise, maybe not Tuli and iced tea, Melton and I can have the whiskey, but when we're sharing a drink in paradise, we're going to be able to go to Poland or what was once Poland and see a place that was once known as Auschwitz and it's going to look somehow redeemed. And I don't know what that means, but I suspect that to be the case. Uh, and if that's the case, then you know, what we do today echoes in eternity, right? So there's work to be done. 
Well, uh, as we know, uh, Christ uh, still has his scars uh, right. in the kingdom of God. So that Precisely confirms right. your point. Mark Melton, any uh, final observations from you? No, I mean, well, I mean, one thing I've thought about with Christian realism lately is just the idea of um, kind of the other extreme of what I would say is not Christian is the idea of if we perf we can perfect structures. And so that's what I think is good about Christian realism is the idea of like, we cannot perfect structures in society because we still have humans that are imperfect. Mm -hmm. And to me, that seems like such a basic um, fact of life that I almost forget that other people see seem to think that we can perfect structures, that it, humans are naturally good, um, and that it's just the structures around them or society that makes them imperfect. And so that's what one thing I like about Christian realism, that it kind of brings back this reality of, in Christianity, we would say it's sin. If I was talking to someone who wasn't Christian, I would say humans are imperfect and prone to selfishness and failure. And so that's one thing I like about this paradigm. Just in the last 72 hours, I've uh, had lunch with uh, two young uh, Christian millennials, very uh, well-informed, uh, one of whom went to a prestigious uh, Christian uh, college, and both of whom said uh, they were not familiar with Christian realism until they came into the circles of uh, providence. So uh, that seems to be the mission of providence, to share this message of uh, Christian realism, not just for a new generation, but for many generations who are unfamiliar with its 10 or its uh, 10 plus one principles. Mark Melton, Mark Bebecki, thank you for another Marxism. Until next week, bye-bye. Take care.